Hello and welcome to the Majlis, a Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty. I am Mohammed Tahir, director of the Turkmen Service at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty. Last week, Turkmenistan has scrapped its oil and gas ministry, which it says to improve performance of Turkmenistan's energy sector. It remains to be seen what difference it's going to make, but uh, the decision followed by number of job cuts in the energy sector, the country's declining economy, as well as Turkmenistan's continued struggle to diversify its energy export. Today in the Majlis, the Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, we will discuss what is happening in Turkmenistan's energy sector, which is vital source of its income. To discuss the subject, I have John Roberts, uh, resident senior fellow at the Dino Patricio Eurasia Center in Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. He is participating from Baku today. John, welcome to the show. Hello, good to be on with you. Very nice to have you. Dr. Lukan Chischi, Director of Central Asian Studies at University of Glasgow, is joining us. Dr. Luka, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Very nice to have you, Dr. Luka. Uh, Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlag Awazi, the Central Asia blog at Radio Free Europe. Radio Liberty is also joining me here in the studio. Bruce, welcome. To Thank the you. Thank you, Bruce. Bruce, uh, let's start with you. Uh, could you please uh, shed light on recent changes in the gas in oil ministry in Turkmenistan? Uh, well, actually, they, they uh, dissolved two bodies, the, the yeah. Ministry of Oil and Gas, and uh, then there was also this, the State Agency on Management and Use of Hydrocarbon Resources. You know, I mean, I mean I'm still grasping with, with the logic behind trying to do this. I, I know we know that both the oil sector and the gas sector have had uh, incredible problems and challenges this year, uh, and... Um, I'll talk a little bit about Turkmen Nebet later. I think that was yeah. probably actually the the thing that prompted. They've had they've had much worse problems, and I think that's probably what what prompted the changes. However, for what, whatever reason, uh, the government and President Berdy Mukhamedov seem to feel that by taking this step, it will improve efficiency. Although you know within both these these structures, but. Uh, the problems that the oil and gas sectors are facing are things that, for the most part, they don't have much control over. So I'm not really sure how this change is going to improve their situation. John, um, how do you read this decision uh, by Turkmen authorities? I think it's it's certainly going to wind up being part of the centralization of power. There's a big problem, which is that essentially the only real force of income Yeah. that Turkmenistan has is from gas. Therefore, whoever runs that ministry, whoever has authority, not just in the ministry, but much more in the state agency for the management of hydrocarbons, right. is going to play a very major role. The problem is that the last manager of the agency has was dismissed last autumn and was subsequently accused of corruption. Clearly, from the government's perspective, which means from the pres- perspective of President Berdy Bahamadov, the institution itself doesn't function. The problem that we have in looking at this is whether indeed it's not simply that agency, but the entire system that is having problems in functioning properly. John, the decision to scrap the ministry and announcing the Turkmen gas as a legal successor of this ministry. How how to explain that? I think you will probably find that this is no more than moving the chairs around as the Titanic thing. There isn't any real rational understanding. It probably relates far more to the question of previous incumbents and to... Uh, the real problem is How do you address failure? And we have had systemic failure over the last decade in that Turkmen's promise, which is enormous given their resources, has not been fulfilled because the Turkmen authorities have never been able to address key issues concerning the role of foreign companies and the need for expertise in developing major projects. Right, right. Dr. Luca, how does the repositioning of the energy ministry 
is going to affect the way the industry functions, the way the the various organizations involving the energy uh, in Turkmenistan will function. But it probably won't affect it in any significant way, mostly because ultimately that kind of revenue stream will always go to the very center of the regime. It is certainly true that uh, whoever got to control that ministry had a direct uh, control of the revenue stream as well. But I never heard of any alternative, if you want, positioning of that particular minister vis-à-vis Berti Mohamedov and his closer entourage. So I really share the view that this is about how to address failure. So in that sense, it's just a measure to take more time, to buy more time to see if things can be turned around. Uh, because I don't think that the model superandi of Turkmenistan will change after this. We'll have probably different people making the same decision across very different ministries. But ultimately, the outcome will always be the same. You cannot turn things around unless you change the way in which you engage with the foreign world, with the international oil companies, with other governments, with neighboring governments. Unless those things are changed, there is no way that we can turn the tide. Right. We will be definitely going to talk about the challenges that the energy ministry or the energy sector is facing in Turkmenistan. Here, uh, Bruce, we don't know much about the reasoning, the intention of the authorities, why they might be doing that so far. But one thing seems to be clear uh, to me at this stage is that the financial structure of the, these two institutions, which will be carrying the some of the authorities that the energy ministry had. The, the one thing was odd that the, the way that it was announced is that Turkmen Gas will be supervising the, the financial uh, structure of the these two organizations. How to explain this complicated situation? We, we were talking about this a uh, little bit earlier. What's odd there, if, from your opinion? Well, th- this kind of feeds into what I mentioned about Turkmen Nebat. Now, of course, I- I'm guessing about some of this stuff too. But but when I said that both the both the oil and gas sectors had been having uh, problems, uh, you know, I mentioned that Turkmen Nebat seemed to be having especially hard problems. And it hmm. it in just in recent months, we found out when during uh, Berdi Muhammadov's visit to uh, to the Balkan province right. uh, that they they had uncovered this massive corruption. Uh, going on in the, within Turkmen Nebet out there where they'd lost possibly hundreds of millions of dollars which had been siphoned off and, and apparently no one had, had been able to track that until recently and then that was followed up by the the big fire or the fire that was reported yeah. at the at Turkmenbashi refinery, which mm-hmm. is of course also the Turkmen Nebet, uh, something Turkmen Nebet oversees, and and that fire I might add happened less than two weeks after they commissioned the new firefighting unit at the Turkmenbashi refinery. So it just looked like the like the whole org- structure of Turkmen Nebet seemed to be falling apart. There was layoffs going on across the country, and so I think that the the decision to restructure uh, the way they they administered the gas and oil industry was kind of a, a, a need jerk reaction uh, by Berdy Mukhamedov or someone else at the top to the the uh, spectacular failures that had just been uncovered or s- witnessed within Turkmen Nebet. Now, if you, and then we look at this at the way that the restructuring thing mm. works, and this is from the Turkmen government website. It says they're transferring all the funds from foreign currency account of the state agency, uh, and it's all going to a special account of the state concern. Turkmen gas hmm. in the central bank of Turkmenistan. So you you rightly point out that uh, it seems like certainly all the money from the oil and gas sector is now the responsibility of Turkmen gas. So that uh, you know I would agree that Turkmen gas, whoever's in charge of that, is is of course obviously someone who's got, gained a lot of prestige within the government. But but again, just because of the problems that Turkmen Nebat had had, and it's it's really secondary to Turkmen gas anyway. Um, but but the problems that they had in Turkmen Nebat were so bad that they seem to someone in the government seems to have lost faith totally in the way that organization has been running. John, is there anything stands out from your point of view about this financial arrangement? Well, the only thing is possibly that you can argue Turkmen Gas, in relative Turkmen terms, is an efficient organization. In strictly, I'm discussing this in Turkmen terms. It has got both competent officials and more to the point, a load of competent technicians. So, for instance, when it's had to cope with emergencies, it has not been too bad. Now, the very fact that you've got a functioning organization that you can see actually produces gas has got massive experience 
within the country and has been up and running for ages means if you think you do not trust an existing institution like the ministry or the state agency, then you hand it over its, those functions to an organization in the sector that seems to work. So I think you can see why they've done it that way. The fact is, though, that you now are going to have, as it were, a business, i.e. Turkmen Gas, whose responsibility has previously been the actual production of hydrocarbons, now are having to turn over to, to take on all the management and responsibility for what you do with the hydrocarbons, how you develop them, all the political challenges. That means it's going to, in practice, have to report straight to the president because it becomes by far the most important institution in the country. So whoever runs it has to have the president's ear and be able to report to them because the one thing you know is that the president is going to be looking at this superb, high, big, super ministry stroke company and saying, you have the future of Turkmenistan in your hands, which is going to make whoever runs that ministry mm. stroke corporation extraordinarily nervous. Right. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm going to throw in something. I wanted to ask Luca a question because I know we've been talking about this, and I hope he can he can explain some of this stuff too. Now we know, according to the the uh, state order that Berdy Mukameda put out, that that now the responsibility immediately falls to into it goes to the cabinet of ministers, and goes to uh, Deputy Prime Minister Yashgildi Kakayev, who's been in charge of of the gas sector or been certainly in, heavily closely involved with that. Uh, what do we know about Yashgildi Kakayev, and and does this recent move show that he's uh, he has become a much more central figure in the government? Well, you're right. It seems to me that there is there there have been a few rounds of purges across energy sector in the last year or so, which of course, for Turkmen terms, it's pretty common. You know, instability when it comes to elite. Uh, tenure. It's, it's a characteristic of both this regime and the prior one. But at every kind, at every round of purges, which, you know, some of them have been executed with surgical precision, Kakayev survived. Kakayev survived. He's still the man in charge of TAPI. He's still the man in charge of many other projects. So it seems to me that we can consider him now the most powerful figure in the gas industry. And uh, Consider that Tukmen Gas has been elevated to that kind of level, uh, he would probably have an influence on the company as well. I want to return to what has been said before about Tukmen Gas. Yes, I agree, there is a lot of expertise in, in the company, but if we, if we are to believe a few websites, the company has been in financial struggle. There has been a lot of work dismissals, a lot of workers have lost their job, they reduced some of the operation. The compressed stations across the country have been hit by serious uh, rounds of dismissals. We also know that the regional subsidiaries of Turkmen Gas in at least two or, two of the five Velayat have actually been, they've seen their workforce reduced by a lot. So it could even be that having an increased budget might lead in the longer run to an expanding workforce. But the expertise that, that you know, John mentioned before is there, has been seriously curtailed by the financial trouble that they have. So if Tukmen Gas is now the supreme organ that really looks after the, uh, the gas industry, which of course is the main employer, is the main GDP contributor, is the main revenue earner, is, is the main industry in the country. Well, we will, there will have to be some funds put into Turkmen Gas because the situation wasn't really positive in the last few months. Mm. You know, if I could just throw in at the uh, end there. Can the... I come in? Oh, yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I, I would very much agree with that. I mean, it's, I can say quite happily that I think in many ways there are some admirable, admirable qualities to Turkmen Gas. At the same time, yes, it is financially very, very constrained. And it is losing some of its expertise as a result of these pressures, which is going to mean it will be even more stretched in the immediate future. And remember, if it brings new people in, 
they will have to be trained and who knows where it is going to get the people from to manage the financial side of a business. So this is all extraordinarily difficult. But and I think there's also there's because something that's worth saying about Kakaia. Kakaia is a survivor. He's quiet, he's reserved. He's not at all like the former head of the state agency, who was a bane and uh, 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 very much self-assured. Kakaev keeps himself to himself, but he is actually far more open. He almost as if he projects the image of being the sort of quintessential former Soviet apparatchik. He's not. He thinks very carefully before he says anything, and he is actually occasionally open to new ideas. It might be quite interesting now that he is no longer, as it were, one of the top two people, but is the undisputed person. He has got the most impossible job you could have in energy on his plate right now, which is namely trying to find how Turkmenistan can break out of its energy isolation at a time when it has no cash and when international interest in Turkmenistan is probably at an all-time low. Wow. John, thank you very much. Dr. Luca, you have uh, something to say, otherwise we will go into a break. Uh, yes, I, I, just, I just wanted to yeah, add sorry. a very quick thing on the training that has been mentioned before. Yeah. I very much agree with that point as well, the, in the last round of uh, reshuffling of the energy sector of Turkmenistan, a few institute training students on energy issue have been closed. So not only because we see Turkmen gas having sort of less financial potential, but we also see that the training, the training capabilities in the country have been decreasing drastically, which is a, you know, a problem for the years to come. Right, right. The, uh, Dr. Luca, thank you very much. Let's take a short break here. When we come back, we will discuss Turkmenistan's energy sector and it is overall challenge. Now, in the first half of the Majlis, we have been discussing about uh, recent changes in the energy sector and what does it mean. In this part of the discussion, let's talk about the challenges that the energy sector is faced with, source of those challenges and ways to overcome those difficulties. Discussing the subject with me today are uh, John Roberts, uh, Senior Fellow at the Dino Patricio Eurasia Center and the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council, Dr. Lucan Chesti, Director of the Central Asian Studies at Glasgow University. University and Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlak Awazi, the Central Asia blog at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I am Mohammed Tahir, director of the Turkmen service at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. John, now uh, scraping uh, the gas and oil ministry is the recent step among many other decisions taken involving the energy sector in Turkmenistan. In recent months, we have seen increasing number of Uh, unconfirmed reports of mass job cuts in the ministry, uh, which is supposed to be the last industry to be affected by any economic decline. What are the some of the other major challenges that the Turkmen energy sector is currently facing, John? The main ones are all concerning external exports. If you want to look about it very simply, Turkmenistan has the world's fourth biggest gas reserves. It contains the world's biggest onshore gas field. Yeah. How do you monetize that resource? Answer, you have to get it into exports in one form or another. Hmm. You can do it directly by pipeline, but much of that is already taken care of by agreements with China. Getting it to new markets that will pay hard cash terms, that market rate, is extraordinarily difficult because either you have to cross Afghanistan, which is a massive security problem that probably cannot be resolved, or you have to get it across the Caspian and into and across Azerbaijan, and that poses uh, enormous uh, questions concerning whether Russia would allow that to happen, Hmm. and indeed what would be the terms of such exports. But more to the point, you can't even do very much indirectly. 
the Turkmens thought they could get a whole lot of petrochemical industries going and export petrochemical goods and fertilizers to countries. But there are gluts in many of these products on the market already. So do you burn the gas and sell it as electricity and export it south to Iran? That's one possibility, but you're not going to get much cash from the Iranians. They mm. go for barter. Yeah. So what, wherever they turn, Turkmen find making hard cash, real money, real income from their natural resource is extraordinarily difficult these days. Right. right. Uh, Dr. Luca, well, in terms of timing of the decision that we have been talking in the first uh, half of the program, uh, describing the energy ministry and the other uh, light offs in the uh, industry, how do you explain the timing? Well, the, the timing, I think, is dictated by the fact that the industry as a whole is at a very much time of crisis. You know, we always knew that when it comes to the country's been going through a two years now economic crisis since the devaluation. And we always told Mohammed that the last two, two industries that were going to be hit by the crisis would be the military first and then the energy. Hmm. I think that this kind of response, restructuring, profound restructuring, because not only you change the structure, you also change the chain of command or the gas industry, is a response, a tentative response to try to address the crisis. Because if we look at the revenues that they are getting, the revenues are actually decreasing quite drastically, whereas the amount of gas that they are selling is pretty much stable. So the crisis they are experiencing, what I've called the export crisis in my writing, is different this time. Because in 1998, in 2008, 2009, they had sudden interruption of their pipelines, which led to decreasing revenues. Whereas this time, they keep selling. Turkmenistan is still selling their gas to China, Iran, and less and less to Russia, but the revenues are decreasing quite significantly. So I think that it's trying to get a creative response to the crisis, and when you realize that the current pipeline, pipeline network might no longer be sort of uh, instrumental to export as much as you can, when the adventure in petrochemicals doesn't really lead to you lead you anywhere, and also the fact that Iran is willing to only to go to Barta, you know, like, and mm. we saw that. The, the same deal they accepted last week was the deal they, they refused last year. So they, they actually had to go for those, for those billions of dollars. So it seemed to me that they're trying to shake up things because this is the time where the crisis has now become fairly severe. Right, right. Um, yeah, John, Dr. Luca, his opinion is that this restructuring in the ministry or the sector is has to do with the e- ongoing economic uh, situation in the country. And until recently, you have been visiting Turkmenistan. You were engaging with the officials there. Were they aware that something is coming up? Were they aware of the si- changing situation there? It's impossible to tell. They did know that they were in an economic crisis of some kind. But you can't... When you have a country with a high degree of personal rule, you cannot tell what is going to happen in advance. There isn't an organized institutional structure and set of procedures that will indicate that there is going to be such a drastic change in how energy is to be managed. So you don't pick, all you can pick up, the most you can pick up, if you're an outsider there, is possibly a sense of unease, that things aren't right and that people don't know how to handle them. So I think that from my last visit, and I have to confess I have not been there this year, Hmm. it is extraordinarily difficult to ever to quite gauge what is going on. Worry you can pick up, yes. What kind of worry, how deep, and whether the worry is personal or whether it's institutional, whether it's worry for the country, those very, very difficult to tell. Uh, Bruce, in terms of Turkmenistan, we have seen that it is quite difficult for them to quickly respond to ongoing situation by a policy change into adopting into the needs of whatever taking place. So how, how do you see going forward 
uh, how the Turkmenistan is going to proceed in this situation. You correctly pointed out that that um, the nature of the regime in Turkmenistan is one that doesn't allow for for uh, an official to come forward and say the policy we've been pursuing is mm-hmm. a total failure and we're going to have to scrap that and start from from the beginning. Uh, they they don't admit to mistakes, um, right. so they're going to have to figure out a way. Uh, at least to spin this, to explain this, uh, any changes they make as being part of a longer-term plan that they always had to begin with, mm. uh, which is which is very unfortunate because that's that's a time-consuming process is to try to force some kind of change into into the system that they've already established there, and that's good. That's going to be a, a major obstacle for them going forward. You know, give, especially given this conversation as uh, to so far, um, there was a time where I thought that perhaps if they had opened up some onshore sites and brought in foreign investment, foreign companies, that it might be a, a salvation for the country. But um, you know, this this all comes back to the export route question of uh, fine, you can bring people in with all the expertise in the world, but that still won't get your gas out of the country. That that'll make it more efficient to produce, but there's still nowhere to send it at the end of the day. So I, I, they are really backed into a corner, and I don't see there's any way out uh you know there's been some discussions with very very brief discussions with russia which i believe is is trying to lead back to a resumption of exports to russia but those were you know as we've heard those were very small amounts in recent years um so that that certainly won't be a salvation for the country i know they started their their oil uh tanker oil exports again to machkala in russia but that's only going to come to two and a half million tons in the course of a year uh, which is nothing there was a time a couple years ago where there was you know we heard that there's there's low interest and there is low interest in turkmenistan uh now a couple years ago there was much more interest and if they had opened up the things a little bit more and decided they were going to bring some companies in to get their gas fields up and producing as fast as possible. It might have looked more attractive. It certainly to to a market like the European Union, who would have maybe put a little more emphasis into pushing forward projects that would link them to Turkmenistan. But I, I don't think the interest is there. The the finances aren't there. The financial interest is not there because the price of gas has come down so low that I just don't see anyone. Certainly, you know, as John mentioned, and as Luca knows too, you're going to risk the rush, the ire of Russia by, by trying to build a Trans-Caspian pipeline. And is it worth it at the price of gas now, especially with Azerbaijan shipping in Tanap coming up soon? Probably hey, not. Can I come in on that point? Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure, Jim. Yeah, it's just the Turkmen's for two decades under Niyazov and in the first sort of seven or eight years of Berdim Hamidov's presidency, they kept wanting to think big. 30 BCM to India or Pakistan to India, 30 BCM or more, maybe 40 or 50 to Europe. And they were encouraged in this in the sense because that is exactly the kind of volumes they're managing to deliver to China. They've never understood that if things go bad, you need to think small. For the last two years, the Azerbaijanis have been pressing them and saying, look, we have a gas balance problem in Azerbaijan. We could happily take a certain amount of gas from you, 5 BCM, maybe even as much as 10 BCM with some going through to export eventually. But we could at least take 5 BCM from you and use it in the Azerbaijani and Caucasus system and help it to build up petrochemical industry over this side of the Caspian. The Turkmen's do not appear to have responded to these openings at all, as far as we can see. We know that the head of SOCAR, the Azerbaijani State Oil Company, went to Ashgabat at least four times, maybe more, and could not bring back an agreement. And I think that the re- one of the reasons they could not bring back an agreement, and they got lots of terms with some of the technical officials as to how it might be done in Turkmenistan, but they couldn't get final clearance at the top for an agreement, And that probably is because it was very difficult for the Turkmen to say, well, we can agree 5 BCM and maybe we'll get something much bigger later, because that's not how they think. They actually have tended in the past to think, well, we've got so much gas, surely people will want to buy big volumes and don't quite understand that the world doesn't necessarily operate like that. Hmm. Interesting, interesting point, John. Um, uh, Dr. Luca, we have uh, already seen some constraints 
in the uh, Turkmenistan uh, due to the crisis. Do you, you mentioned the lie of in the energy sector and scrapping the energy ministry, and you also mentioned the economic uh, 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 crisis there. So what do you think? What is coming next? What is going to happen next? Well, I'm very happy to hear that Kakhayev is open about new ideas because this is exactly what they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they will need to rethink their their export policy. Um, it's what they've done so far, either with what John was saying, just going for the big shots, or to keep sort of obstructing the entry of foreign actors into onshore development. This is no longer sustainable. Again, the, the, the statistics are pretty clear. The, the export crisis is, is major and the revenues are decreasing. And the revenue is not just about uh, economic capital, it's also political capital. The president would be able to do less and less with the revenues that he gets, which creates issues of uh, cooptation or clientelism and, of course, overly fragmentation in the longer run. There is no serious attempt at diversification. We haven't heard anything. Uh, petrochemicals didn't work. So it seemed to me that they they put themselves in a corner. They got the back of the wall now, and they need to get out of uh, where they are. And the thing is that in the last three or four years, everyone has been calling the situation to happen. Like, we knew that the writing was on the wall. And, and now this sort of further restructure of the energy industry, the gas industry in particular, has to be seen, for me, as, as in, probably the last attempt hmm. to, to, turn th- to turn things around. Also because, you know, like every week, I mean, you and your team, Mohammed, publish new examples on how the crisis is bad in different sections, foreign reserve, foreign currency, and so on and so forth. There will be a time in which these things will become bigger and bigger, unless I mean, given this is essentially a mono-resource economy, unless things change in the gas industry. So I'm afraid I can't be optimistic, but if I interpret this, this change in a positive way, if I give a positive spin to what we're discussing today, it seems to me that Kakaia will let to come up with new answers. Answers, by the way, will let to be shared by the president as well, because the president has got a very firm grip on power. We've seen that he's very interested in creating some sort of dynasty, so it's not a man who's actually ready to give up. So it's the end, the energy power in the gas cloud is actually very important for him. So we'll see. It's Again, watch this space, uh, but the, the room for optimism is shrinking on, on a daily basis, I'm afraid. Thank you, uh, Dr. Luca. It's a good point to end the discussion here, John. The final point, and I know you have been doing lots of consulting on the energy sector uh, over the past several years. Imagine Berdo Muhammadov is listening to you. Uh, what would you say to him to do next to, to, uh, to be able to deal with the situation that he's faced today? It's probably far too late, but should a major international company come to his attention with a suggestion for a combination of construction of a major external pipeline in exchange for a direct stake in the upstream sector, he should look very carefully and change, if necessary, whatever regulations would prohibit such an arrangement. One would hope that he would be able to see that although such an arrangement would certainly be in the company's interest, it would also be in Turkmenistan's interest. Right. Thank you. Thank you, John Roberts, a senior fellow at the Dino Patricio Euro Asia Center and Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council for your insightful thoughts, Dr. Loka Anchesti, Director of Central Asian Studies at the University of Glasgow, Bruce Panier, Editor of Kishlak Awazi, the Central Asia blog at the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Thank you, gentlemen, for being part of the Majlis today. Thank you. Also, also before to uh, end the majlis today, I just wanted to make a short announcement that this is probably my last show from Prague uh, in, the oh. capa- in the capacity of the Turkmen Service Director. As of August, I will be running the majlis from Washington, D.C. in a different capacity as the Media Relations Manager on Asian Affairs for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists, for being available for the Majlis for, the, for more than the last uh, two years. I know, uh, John, you have been in the, in the Majlis uh, more than once. And Dr. Luca, you have been one of our uh, regular guests. Practically a co-host. And, and co-host. And Bruce <laughs> Panier is a co-host, always uh, very helpful here in the studio. Thank you very much for uh, being uh, part of the success of the Majlis. Lahmad, thank you very much for hosting it. And please, will all three of you accept my apologies for mocking you around by not being able to do it earlier in the week? No problem. No problem. No it's problem. well worth waiting for. No problem. No. So I look forward to keeping the momentum from DC as of August. So this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of Timajlis, the Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Bye-bye.